Um, you know, it's funny. I, I, this is not part of the message. Well, maybe it is now. <laughs> um, I, I was thinking this week, and I keep talking about the merger, like it's something that's coming. The merger's over. You know, we are Center Point Church. That's it's done. It's it's it's, it's kind of cool. Look around. Take a, this is this is pretty cool. Um, what's happening now is what's called integration and and bringing together the the two congregations to help us to become one and and that is fraught with challenges and struggles and all of the human things because everybody here brings their humanity with them i have yet to find someone who didn't bring themselves right along with them you know and so that is what i pray that you continue to pray for that as we draw nearer to each other that we draw nearer to you in the midst of that um you know that was just on my heart so this morning, we are sticking with a summer with James. We're in week number three, which is uh, for favoritism forbidden. So let me read the passage. This is one of the more challenging, and I got more challenging. James is challenging, but this is one of them. Uh, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you go stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who, you, who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name to, of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you don't commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Kind of just laying it down, right? Oh, I should read this. Oh, I did read that. Sorry. <laughs> that is funny. Did you keep up, Lyra? No? <laughs> it was worth a shot. Uh, it was a long time ago I heard a story. It was from, from a pastor who had been uh, given a very impressive appointment. You know, um, I'm not familiar with the GMC, but in the, in the denomination that shall be, not be named. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. In the UMC, it, it was often a... Uh, judging of the hierarchy, depending on, on how, how big your congregation was and where you were on the ladder as you made your way through from young to as you aged and got bigger churches, right? That was the goal. The goal was never to stay in a small church, but to be in the small church and then work your way to the top. And, um, and this, this, this is, reminds me of that because this, this guy, this pastor, he'd been given one of those appointments at one of the large churches, and he was happy about it. He was talking, he was explaining how different this church was from his previous experiences. Evidently, there was a group of wealthy folks in the church, benefactors who kept the church going, uh, but they also ran the show. Whatever they said goes, it was pretty much law in the church. And the pastor said, the first thing I have to do when I get there is to wine and dine a bunch of people. I really have to get on their good side. And that stance is concerning, to say the least. It's not what I'm about, you know, you're going to hear stuff you don't like from me, you know, that's just the way it is, you know, if I'm paying more attention to what God is saying, then I need to be able to try to deliver what he's saying, even if it's uncomfortable, you know, we each stand as a person loved by Christ and gifted to be who we are, and a pastor should not treat congregants differently based on giving or status or anything else, honor people, hear me, yes, we honor people. We are appreciative of people. I did it this morning with the volunteers, grateful to them. But they don't run the show. 
so we don't cater to their whims, you know. And I've had people do that in other churches that I've been to. They say, well, you, you shouldn't do this or you should do that, you know. And I listen, and then I go with whatever it is that God is telling me to do, regardless of consequence. So I haven't been run out yet, so. <laughs> it's early, though, right? See, if it's not aligned with the mission to reach people for Jesus, then the answer is no. Because we're about doing things to align, to, to go after, to show Jesus to people in our community, in our world. We've got to do that. And it ain't easy. It's hard enough without, you know, the, the inner squabbles that sometimes happen. Because it happens not just in big churches, it's small churches. We sometimes cater to those we think are the major givers or show partiality in other ways. Sometimes we cater to those who have longevity in the church. They and their families have, become, have been active in the church for many years, so we elevate them based on that. At other times, we may cater to new members, you know, those, or those we hope to become new members and bring new life into the church. And other times, we cater to those who we consider to be the good workers in the church, those who have standing in the community or some other type of notoriety. And it's easy to cater to those who complain the loudest just to get it to stop. At other times, we cater to our friends or those we, who, who we think like us. But all of this is contrary to what Scripture is telling us today. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convinced of the law, convicted of the law as a transgressor. So the first point for this morning that Scripture makes clear is that favoritism is a serious mistake. It's a sin. But again, I, it, the challenge for me this morning, I'll just tell you what I'm trying to do this morning. I'm trying to be able to deliver a message that points out that favoritism is not okay under any circumstances. And honoring people is absolutely okay and something that we should do. And I know that those things can overlap. But they're important. They're important. Favoritism is sin. The Old Testament in particular is especially strong on it. The poor, the aliens, the widows, and orphans were protected in name by the law. They were protected by the law. Romans says this, God does not show favoritism. And if our lives are to model the character of God, guess what? We won't, I'll make you say it, so you might as well. <laughs> what does it mean? We won't show favoritism. You know, we have our, within the context of the church, we are a, a horizontal hierarchy, so to speak. You know, we're each as important as the other. But we do honor people. That's my challenge. You know, I hope that, that today you walk out understanding that honoring people is okay, but not catering to people, I guess, would be the way to do it. And it's not just a little thing. It's serious sin. Serious because if you're elevating someone, what else is happening? Somebody else just got put down. We don't do that in a Christian church. We don't do that. Jesus didn't do that. If our goal is to be like Jesus, guess what? We don't do that. Putting people down is something that we don't do. I don't care if you don't like them. You got to love them. There is no love except. You know, they're love everybody except. Anybody in here got people who just grate on your nerves? No, about five of you? <laughs> they just get you, right? They get you upset. They do all that. And guess what you got to do? You got to love them anyway. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Who is this Jesus anyway? Who does he think he is telling us what to do? <laughs> oh, yeah, Savior, God, <laughs> Son of God. Yeah, he's the one that we listen to and we seek to follow. <laughs> Favoritism is not okay. They've had trouble with this, by the way, since the early church. I mean, the Acts church, the one that we lift up on a pedestal. We'll talk about that in a minute, too. When you elevate someone, you're invariably lowering somebody else, and faith and favoritism are not compatible. Faith and favoritism... Don't go together. We're not to distinguish between the haves and the have-nots, whatever it is that they have or don't have. And it is hard. It's 
what we're talking about this morning is one of the most difficult things. If you actually seek to do this, this is one of the most difficult things about being a Christian. Because we got to love people we don't even want to be around. But we got to love them. And that's why for me, I've, I've adopted this understanding of love in this context. To love is to see someone better off for having known me. And I, I may not like you or I may not like somebody or something that's going on. But I want you to be better off for having known me. I want, I want you to know a little bit about Jesus for just for bumping into me. You know, whatever that looks like and whatever that takes, that's love. And that ain't easy either. But I haven't found the passage yet where Jesus said, to follow me is going to be so easy you won't believe it. <laughs> I haven't found that one. <laughs> I've read the whole thing many times. <laughs> But we just don't do that. We're to be one in the Spirit. And, you know, we talked about this, that whole first series of being one as the Father and Son are one. That's the goal for us, to be one as the Father and Son are one. It was hard for them back there. In the New Testament, there were certain, several times when this problem reared its head. One example is when a certain group of believers wanted to demand that all non-Jews be required to follow the Jewish traditions. That meant getting circumcised and not eating certain stuff and doing all that. It was a struggle until Peter, who was part of that struggle in the beginning, but he had a, had a pretty powerful dream that got his attention, stood up in the midst and he said, that, um, after, brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from the lips, my lips, from my lips, the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them. Just as he did to us, he made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. And the result was that the church should treat everyone who believed in Christ and had received this holy name the same, without distinctions. And Peter was one of those who was loudest on the front, right? He's, he, was, he was always loudest on the front. But on, in this too, he was, it was the Jews and everybody else. And he was not part of the Paul delivering the message to the Gentiles. And that was Paul that opened that door. And Peter was given a dream that opened it further and helped people to understand. After the Holy Spirit came upon the believers at Pentecost, the problem of favoritism appeared in that church that we like to elevate, I, that I like to elevate. Man, can't we be like the Acts church and be somebody's over here? You're learning, you're feeding folks, you're taking care of Man, Why can't we be that? Well... <laughs> Even back then, they had troubles. The Christian community was taking care of the widows, distributing food and other items on a daily basis. The problem was that they now had some non-Jews living among them, among them. It was easy when we were all the same. Isn't it always easy when we're all the same? It gets difficult when, when we open the door to others. The problem was that the non-Jews living with them, strangers from other places, and they couldn't deal with it. Racism dies hard. Racism dies hard. I don't know who was there. They probably had some of them Samaritan people who they didn't like. They probably had some Roman people getting the word of God and the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And who had? Oh, wait a minute. The Romans can't be in here with us. They're not chosen. It went so far that the widows who were not Jewish Christians were not being treated as well as the others were. That's how far it went. If you remember, the, the disciples were studying and learning, and they were doing their kind of thing over here. They had to stop doing that because the widows were not being treated the same. The, the daily distribution was, it was not the same for all. And, and so they had to stop and appoint seven men to oversee that distribution just to be sure that it would be equitable and that this, this inequitable system would no longer happen. And it's significant that the verse which concludes that account says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. The inequality, what that means is that this inequality, this treating people not the same, led to a block and a movement. And once that block was removed, then the Spirit of God had freedom to work forward. And it wasn't until that was addressed that the Word of God spread and this happened. 
the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly because they stopped doing what they wanted and started doing what God wanted. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I believe that it will happen the same way for us, as challenging as that is. When a church shows favoritism to any group, it hinders the Spirit of God. Some level of power is lost. And the witness of the church gets damaged. And we see this a lot in our social media driven society and all that we have going on. Favoritism is a sin. But the second point that the scripture makes is that it's also a serious mistake <laughs> because appearances can be deceived. And Jesus confused the minds of the religious leaders of the day with unlikely people to become his followers. What were the jobs of his followers? Fishermen, tax collectors. Political extremists, had some zealots in there, had women, prostitutes were following him. What? Now you're right. The poor, the lame, once they could walk, what do you think they did? Just left? Some did, most didn't. He had a following. He picked James and John, sons of thunder. You know who else he picked? Judas Iscariot, who went with him for three years. His parables, they made heroes out of people we would not expect. The prodigal son. It's a tough story, huh? Son says, give me what, Dad, give me what I want. Speaking of Father's Day, just give me what I want. I'm going to go and make my own way. And so he gives him his inheritance, and he goes and makes his own way, all right? He makes his own way right into the ground. You know? And it's got to be bad for a Jewish kid to be in with slopping hogs when it dawns on him. You know, I get treated better as a servant at my dad's house than I would here. And he goes back home. Funny thing is, and I always emphasize this because I just believe this completely, you know who saw him from the gate, right? Nobody? Who? His sister? Father? His father saw him from the gate, which tells me that he wasn't, that wasn't his first day out at the gate. He was at the gate. He was looking down the road. He's like, I'm sure his prayer was, Lord, let my son come home. Just want my son to come home. The Good Samaritan where the good guys all walked across on the other side of the street so they wouldn't get unclean. And the only one who would help the Jewish guy that was beaten by the robbers was a Samaritan, and of one that they hated. The Jews hated Samaritans. You don't think Jesus was trying to make a point? How about the rich man and Lazarus? Not that Lazarus, a different Lazarus. You know, the poor, the, the Lazarus is up there in heaven, the rich man's in, in, in Hades, and, and he says, just give me a drip of water. He said, I can't do it. Well, go warn my, go warn my brothers. He said, didn't do any good with you, won't do any good with them. Lazarus was the one elevated in that story, which is upside down thinking. His sayings did that all the time. You know, turn that thinking up. We still struggle with this. I still do. God, God likes to do upside down stuff. You know, what I think, it ought to be this. And he said, no, Mike, it's this. You know. The last would be first. The poor would be blessed. Only servants can be leaders. Explain that one to me. Putting a towel around his waist. The rabbi the rabbi putting a towel around his waist, washing the feet of his disciples. That was not done. That was wrong. Except it was right. It's something. Those of low position would be lifted to a place of honor. See, in God's economy, appearances are deceiving. Appearances are deceiving. We have a different status bar, I guess. You know, how can I make more, how can I serve more people and how can I elevate people to being more, more than I am? Christianity. The poor who are rich and the rich who are poor. 
the weak who are strong and the strong who are weak. It's amazing we even read a book like that. But this is true. When we show favoritism to those who have position and power in culture, we're honoring the wrong people. We're just honoring the wrong people. And there, by the way, there's nothing wrong with having money and things. I, that's not what that's about. Love of those things gets you in trouble. But there's nothing at all wrong with having things. It's what are you doing with them? How are you reaching people? How are you using those to elevate some folks who need to be elevated? How are you doing that? Use your, use your gifts, your personal talents and, your, and the, the gifts that you, if you're one of those who is blessed with abundance, use that to make a difference in this world, reaching people for Jesus. You know, John Wesley said, make as much as you can, save as much as you can so you can give as much as you can. You know? When we go by the outside appearances, we're missing what God is doing. Remember the story of David? Who, who did he go to see Jesse? Who, do, who was he? Who, who did Jesse think he was going to be seeing? The old ones, right? They looked like warriors. You want a king? Take my oldest. Eliab. Surely the Lord's anointed stands here. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height. For I have rejected him. I don't work like you work, is basically what he said. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. If Samuel had gone by outward appearance, he would not have chosen David. One, he wasn't there. Two, the other brothers fit the bill. David was a 17-year-old shepherd boy out in the field chasing sheep. Who do you pick to be the next king? It ain't that kid out there in the field. You pick the one that looks like he's going to be a king. That's the right thing to do. That's the, that's the earthly thing to do. And what does God do? He's like, uh-uh. No, flip it up. Go the other way. What mistakes we make when we judge people by their appearances. I have been wonderfully surprised at times by people whose outward appearances would lead you to believe that they didn't have much to offer, but they came to Christ and they gave out of their heart and that, that Christ, the beauty of God's love, flowed out of them and through them. We have that happening in here, by the way. There's some folks who you would never think are as generous as they are. And yet they are. And perhaps they didn't have much education, but they became full of the wisdom of God and they faithfully followed God. Faithfully followed God. You know, perhaps you don't have much money. That's okay. You can be extremely generous in giving because of how the grace of God has touched your life. Perhaps you're not physically attractive, but your heart is beautiful as a result of God's touch. People are drawn to that inner beauty. So when we reject people based on an outward appearance, we make a serious mistake because appearance can be deceiving. Not to mention that it's an insult to God whose image they are created in. Remember Mother Teresa? She worked among the lepers in Calcutta. She was not put off by the stench of the leper colonies, or the filthy wounds, or the rotting flesh. Instead, she touched them and she held them. She saw Jesus in them. What would happen to us if everybody we saw, we saw Jesus in them? Would you treat somebody harshly if you saw Jesus in them? Would you throw somebody away if you saw Jesus in them? As she touched him, she saw herself touching Christ. She said this, she said, do we look at the poor with compassion they are hungry not only for food, but they are hungry to be recognized as human beings. My third point for this morning is that it's a serious mistake. Favoritism is a serious mistake. The reason is that God opposes the proud, and he's not shy about his word telling us this. First Peter 5.5, 5. read that one to me. How about this one? Of 
Amen. Amen. When, you think, when we think that we're better than somebody else, and here's, a, here's a hard truth. If you th- if when we think that we're better than somebody else, God opposes us. Wow. One of the scariest verses, this is not part of this, but it just is right now, so I guess it is again. One of my scariest verses is, is the one that says, Judge not lest you be judged, because what judgment you use will be judged against you will be used against you. So if I judge harshly, what kind of judgment is going to be used against me? But if I judge leniently, what? Well, then it will be lenient. So I've tried to remember that because I'm just like you. This is not an easy thing. There are people that are hard. They're hard to like, let alone love. But it doesn't change that that's the requirement. When you think that you, what you say carries more weight than anybody else, God opposes you. And you think that you're better than others because you're intelligent, good-looking, or a good athlete, God opposes you. When you lack humility, when you lack humility, God opposes you. At one point, Jesus sent out 72 of his followers to preach and heal in the surrounding towns. When they returned, they were full of joy at what God had done through them. You might think that those who are trained, who went were trained at the Jerusalem Theological Seminary so that they could go out there, right? That would that'd be who was best suited to the task. But Jesus rejected the educated religious professionals. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. The number one qualification for being used by God is a humble and teachable spirit. Humble, teachable spirit. If you think you've arrived, then you need to know you ain't even left the station yet. You ain't even left yet. And the Apostle Peter was one who had trouble with it. He was proud to be a Jew. He was he was with Jesus for three years. Even after the resurrection, even after Pentecost, Pentecost, he still thought God preferred the Jewish people. They were his own race. But God was about to bring him face to face with the truth about his pride. Jews were not allowed to eat certain kinds of meat. It was biblical law. God came to Peter in a vision. He showed him several unclean animals that were unlawful to eat and told him, Peter, get up and eat. And then God told this to him. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And then he woke up to a brand new world, one that included Gentiles. And he went and he told the other believers, he told them what had happened. He said, look, we got it wrong. He had to be humbled for that to happen, but he was. Peter would never have considered going into the home of somebody who wasn't a Jew, but God changed that, enlarged his thinking, so to speak, through a vision. And as he went home, went into the home and began explaining to them the things of God, amazing things happened. You're well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him there, but God has shown me that I should not call any man impure and unclean. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. He was no longer the proud and judgmental Peter. He'd been changed. He was no longer looking to compare himself to others. He was changed. He was no longer looking at others with the human eye, but through through the cross, through the eyes of God, through through the humility of Christ. And he understood that when we see people as less important than others, we are not looking, we're not seeing the Christ in them. And we need to see the Christ in one another. There was a Sunday, this is way back, back in hippie days. Gosh, I guess I was born in those days. I was running around, probably 10 years old. Goodness gracious, what happened to time? <laughs> Back in the 70s, there was a young man. He walked into church midway in the, in the service. He was a hippie. Never, obviously, never been to been to the service. He, he walked down in the aisle. He didn't know what to do. He wasn't trained in, in church churchies or Christianity or Christianese or whatever the, the right way of doing things is. So you know what he did, of course. He plopped himself down and sat Indian style on the center row. And, and then the, the preacher saw him and... The other people, and you know what happened, right? It's like, look, what's he going to do? 
what's, what's Mike going to do with that guy? He's sitting there in the middle of the aisles. What's he going to do? You know, and as, as the rumble starts to grow amongst the crowd, you know, uh, Mike, I am up there. You know, I really, it wasn't really me, but the guy who was a pastor was up here not knowing what to do either. Oh, oh, what do I do? Do I go explain to him the rules and that he's not abiding by the right rules to come to church? Or, or what do I do? And then the old, one of the oldest men in the congregation, he's a 90-year-old elder, and he got up, and the whole place is like, yeah, he's going to get it now. We know Jim. Jim. <laughs> and and he, he goes over to him with his cane. He gets up there by him. And he sits down right next to him in the aisle. Puts his arm around him. He says, glad you're here pastor at the end of the service issued an altar call. You know what, what person went forward? The young man. Are we willing to put our arms around people that aren't like us? I think our Father in Heaven would be glad if we would. Because there's one name under Heaven through which we will be saved, through which our sins are forgiven, our burdens are lightened. You get to be who you are. You're made specially by God for that purpose. But not just for you. You're made to be who you are for Him. Father, I pray that that happens in this place. I pray. I pray that your name will be elevated, that you would be for each of us, our God, our Father, our friend, the one who challenges us to be better, the one who forgives us when we mess up. We love you, Lord. Amen.